Our Our Father, Father, who who art in in heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we, uh, before we open up scripture today, let's pray together. Gracious God, we, um, we just give you thanks for holding it all together holding all of creation together, holding all of our lives together, holding us together. God, we give you thanks for doing the thing that we are just so incapable of doing for ourselves. God, as we open up your word, would you um, continue to hold it all together in our lives? Would you continue to show us uh, who you are? Would you reveal to us a, a little bit about your nature, a little bit about who you are, And God, would you open our hearts and open our ears so that we might receive that uh, today through your word. God, would the uh, words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together, would they be uh, pleasing and acceptable to you today too? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up to the Gospel of Luke. Um, If you don't, that's okay. The words are going to be on the screen behind me too. Uh, We're going to be in Luke Uh, chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13 together today. So friends, hear the word of the Lord. He, Jesus, was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you anything because he is a friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who seeks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Prayer. I don't know about you, but I might say prayer feels like one of the easiest, most natural things we can ever do and simultaneously feels like maybe the hardest and most unnatural thing we can ever do. I say it like this, maybe it's the easiest and most natural thing we'll ever do because it seems like we're hardwired to seek a creator. As creatures of a creator, we are hardwired to look for something beyond ourselves. We're hardwired, as one scholar says, we're hardwired to to pray two things, thank you and help me. 
These might feel supernatural to us. One writer, one scholar says it like this, um, that, that when we find our, our, ourselves at a loss for words, maybe when we're struck by beauty or struck by our own pain or someone else's pain, we find ourselves groaning, maybe, maybe just a, a sigh or an ah. Maybe like when a firework goes off in the air and you feel something inside you just stirred with beauty or wonder. That, as one writer might say, is a prayer in and of itself, reaching out to, to a creator beyond ourselves. Prayer can really be that easy. Sometimes we find ourselves praying or communicating with God without even really meaning to, but prayer can also be one of the hardest and most unnatural things we'll ever do. When's the last time you ran into someone or were face-to-face -face with someone that you were really impressed by or maybe starstruck by. Has this ever happened to you? Have you been starstruck by anybody before face-to-face -face with somebody you just, you don't know what to say, right? Uh, this happened to me once. I was at a single-A baseball game. I ran into the Major League Baseball number one prospect in gym shorts and a hat, and my friend who was with me is like, that guy is amazing. We should go talk to him. And I'm like, sure, let's go talk to this guy. And you know what I said? I was like, hey, you play good. I wish you were playing tonight. Take a picture with me, right? We get awkward and we don't know what to say. Now, imagine this. When we pray, we are praying to the creator and sustainer of all that is. What do we say? Prayer is also wrapped in a ton of mystery, isn't it? We are praying to the God who knows exactly what we're going to say before we say it. What if we say the wrong thing? And if God already knows what we're going to say, why, why do we have to pray it at all? I don't know. There's a ton of mystery around this. But prayer is also hard because of this. It bumps up against our busyness. It bumps up against this culture of busyness that we live in, right? Don't, don't we really like to do don't we really like to get stuff done and check off boxes in to-do lists? Aren't we really good at that? Prayer is often not that. Prayer can often feel like the opposite of that, and we can often set it aside in favor of things that we can check off our list. I, I have to admit, embarrassingly, that I'm, I'm pretty guilty of this. Some people refer to themselves or refer to other people as prayer warriors. I don't think anybody is going to refer to me as that, and I certainly wouldn't refer to me as that. If I'm, if, if I'm honest, prayer for me is even one of those things that when chaos seems to happen, that I'm pretty prone to even push that aside in my own life. And let's, let's face it together. Let's be honest together. We do like to be productive, don't we? It can be hard to to pray when prayer feels so unproductive. And if you're anything like me, maybe you can pop out of the, the current and the stream of busyness. You can pop out of that long enough to sit down and decide, I'm going to spend some time in prayer, only to find out your mind is still racing a thousand miles an hour, still in the current of busyness. On top of all this, maybe as the overall reason that we have such a hard time feeling prayer is natural, or the reason it feels unnatural is because we kind of like to think of ourselves as self-sufficient. We kind of like to think of ourselves as being a, a, enough for ourselves, right? That we are Dutch Midwesterners for the most part. We like to, to, to not need any help from anyone. We rarely want to burden anyone for any help we hold on to phrases like God helps those who help themselves and God will never give me more than I can handle. Spoiler alert, those are not actually in Scripture. But we get it, right? We don't like to admit that we need help. We don't like to admit that we're not self-sufficient. But we sometimes, like toddlers, sometimes we need to insist that we can't do things all by ourselves. This all makes prayer feel pretty unnatural. 
And just like everything that feels unnatural, what do we, what do we need? We need to be taught. When it's not natural to us, we need to be taught how to do the thing that isn't natural. Prayer is just like that. Prayer is something that we must learn. The disciples were no different. In the Gospel of Luke, one of the disciples comes up and says to Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. Know, know this about the first century, uh, the first century context. It, it would have been super common for a rabbi um, to teach his followers, his disciples, a, a prayer. To teach them a, a common, specific prayer that would unify them as, as his disciples. It was a, almost a unifying uh, common mark of who they were following, what rabbi they were following. So likely John had done that. John the Baptist. Likely John the Baptist had done that, and now the disciples heard about it and said, Jesus, do, do the same thing for us. Do that for us. Teach us to pray. So Jesus does. He gives them this short, powerful prayer that would, that would really become a summary of of Jesus' ministry. It would really wrap up really nicely what Jesus would do while he, was, while he was on earth walking among his disciples. It's a prayer that reflects a vision of shalom, a vision of wholeness, a vision of reconciliation. Now, we also get this prayer in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel is maybe the one that we know a little more uh, commonly, it's a little more developed. It's a little more closely uh, related to what we call today the Lord's Prayer. And it was more closely, more developed into what now for generations, for thousands of years, has been a prayer that's united the church and shown the church as followers of Jesus all the way even to today. So I mentioned this last week, but today we're starting this sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to walk really slowly and really intentionally through the Lord's Prayer, through the whole summer um, together. And, and what, what I hope for us together is that we not only see what Jesus taught us to pray, but that we might learn and be changed by what Jesus desires that our desires might be shaped and molded more to match the desires of Jesus. So we're going to do that this summer. This is the first, the first of, excuse me, of a few. Now one thing that stands out to me, maybe you caught this, one thing that stands out in Luke's account is this, that what prompts the disciples to ask for Jesus to teach them is that Jesus was already praying, right? It, Luke says, he was praying in a certain place. So in a real way, Jesus was already teaching them. They, they didn't know it. They didn't see it at the time. But in a real way, Jesus was showing them this is what prayer is like. This is what a life of prayer looks like. And prayer continues to be a, a central theme in Jesus' uh, Jesus life all throughout Luke's gospel, especially Luke's gospel. We see time after time after time that Jesus finds prayer, uh, being alone, being, being in communication with God, authentically and real, is a central theme of his life. And it continues then. Luke writes the book of Acts. The book of Acts is like a sequel to Luke's gospel. And we see that primary, uh, prayer is a primary theme there too. Prayer is actually, in Acts, is actually kind of the main way that God's power comes into earth comes into what the what the church is doing prayer is the 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 vehicle for god's power it's the vehicle that sends the church on mission to be on mission right where they are all that to say prayer matters i know understatement of the year right but luke and acts and jesus life they show us that prayer matters So Jesus teaches us too. Jesus doesn't only teach the disciples, he teaches us too so that we might go out on mission. 
to love God and love others right where we are so that we might uh, harness and bring the power of God into our communities through prayer. Luke and Acts show us that this isn't just a mark of who we follow. The Lord's Prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer, is not just a mark of who we follow, but it actually is the way that God's power goes through us on mission in the places that we are. It shows us that prayer really does make a difference. Prayer really does make a difference. Again, understatement of the year, maybe, but maybe if you're like me, Maybe you know this. You know that prayer really does make a difference. But maybe, maybe we sometimes hold prayer as a, a Hail Mary, a, a last chance, right? The, the last play of the game, right? Something we go to after we've exhausted our resources, we've exhausted our strength. We're out of ideas. Now then, maybe that's when we go to prayer, seeking the Lord. But I think what Jesus invites us to in his teaching of how to pray, I think what he invites us to is that prayer is actually one of the primary activities of what, what it means to follow Jesus. That prayer is not a last resort, but it's a beginning point. Now, especially with the, the Lord's Prayer as we know it, there are tons of faith traditions and tons of ancient litur liturgies that are still used today that use lord's prayer in them sometimes every day sometimes every day in the life of people that use these uh, faith traditions and liturgies but but sometimes even just at the least every sunday and when these traditions use the lord's prayer every sunday this is how many of them begin before they pray pray the lord's prayer together they begin like this now as our savior jesus christ taught us to pray we are bold to say bold to say, bold to pray the words that Jesus taught us. Think about that. Bold. These really are bold words, aren't they? It's, it's bold enough to, to, to pray, to come into community with God, but it's bold to say the words, especially from the Lord's Prayer, that say this. When we pray boldly, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, it's radical. And honestly, it's pretty risky. We're praying for nothing less, right? Think about this with me. We're praying for nothing less than God to bring his will, to, to, to say to God, we want you to do what you want to do at the expense of what I want you to do. I want you to do, God, what you're going to do more than I want what I want. It's risky. It's bold. Jerry Sitzer, uh, he's a, a, a theologian and an author, he says this in one of his books, prayer like this, prayer like this, like the Lord's Prayer, is not something to be taken lightly. It's like handling an explosive. It's bold. And, get this, and by God's own choosing, by God's own will, especially prayers like this for the kingdom to come, by God's own will, he chooses to do something through our prayers. He chooses to do something in the world, do something in shaping and molding the world. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I understand the mystery of that. I can't tell you that I understand the mystery of God's sovereignty. But what I can say is that that power to do something in the world through prayer. The power that goes along with God choosing to do something through our prayers, the power for that doesn't reside in us. It doesn't reside in our own faith, doesn't reside in our own righteousness or our own goodness. That power resides in the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. That power resides only in the Holy Spirit. And we get a, a, a picture of this. Paul in, uh, in Philippians he writes to a church in Philippi from house arrest, right? He's writing from house arrest, and he invites the church in Philippi to pray for him. And he says this, he says, through your prayers, I will be delivered, is what Paul says. Paul understood the power. I don't know if Paul understood the mystery or the method either, but Paul understood the power and invites them to devote themselves to prayer. 
And in that devotion to prayer, Paul knew that they, and now us today, can trust that the Holy Spirit will give direction and give shaping and will do something by the power of God through the Holy Spirit to shape the world. We'll do something in order to bring about what God desires in the world. I don't know about you, but I always find this so freeing. This idea that the Holy Spirit is shaping and molding our prayers, this is so reassuring. I'll be honest with you, I sometimes don't have any idea what to pray for. Especially sometimes when I sit with families who have sick loved ones, I don't always know what to pray for. And maybe you found yourself in a spot too of just having no idea what to pray for. Sometimes I actually just name, God, I don't know what to pray for, but you know, you know what's needed. God, I don't know what to pray for, but we want more of you. God, I don't know what to pray for or ask for, but we want your presence. So as your pastor, I want you to hear me tell you that it's okay to, to be short of words, to not know what words to pray to God in a given moment. It's okay to be at a loss for words. It's okay to be overwhelmed with joy or grief. It's okay that you don't know how to form words for a prayer. Paul, again, Paul says in Romans 8, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us, and, and, and even then, our sighs and our groans, the things inside of us that don't have words, even those, even those are taken by the Holy Spirit and molded and shaped into perfect prayers that God the Father hears. Perfect prayers that reach the ears of our Heavenly Father. reassuring. Now, maybe, maybe you notice there's something kind of troublesome in this text. There's something kind of, kind of weird about this text, and it's this, this kind of weird parable after Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. Maybe you caught it, and you're like, boy, that's odd. It's a really strange parable after he teaches the disciples how to pray, and the parable is essentially this situation. Imagine with me for a second that tonight at midnight, a friend of yours, a friend, a van load of kids come to your house and you're so happy to see them, but it's midnight and you don't have any food and you don't have anything to drink. And it's Sunday, so fairway is closed. You can't even go to Pizza Ranch for crying out loud. But you don't have any food to give anybody, so where do you go? Naturally, you go to your neighbor. You knock on their door. You knock and knock and knock. And instead of coming to the door, they poke their head out the window, their bedroom window, and they're like, hey, man, I'm, I'm kind of in bed already. It's late. Sorry, go away. And you're like, dang it. So you ring the doorbell again and again and again and again. And finally, your neighbor comes to the door. And your neighbor says, fine, get out of here. Here is a Tupperware container of leftovers, or maybe it's a Cool Whip container fine, get out of here, take my leftovers, just leave me alone. You've got a grumpy neighbor, but you've finally got food and drink to give your friends. Jesus says the punchline of this parable is this, I tell you, even though he, even though the neighbor will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, he will get up because of your persistence and give you what you need. And then Jesus ends the parable by saying, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Here's why this is troublesome. Because on the surface, on the surface, it, it feels like Jesus is comparing God the Father to a grumpy neighbor who just wants to get his sleep, right? It gives us this kind of troubling picture of God, that God is a sort of get off my lawn kind of God. Like, fine, just get off my lawn. But that's not, that's not what Jesus is doing with this parable. This is one of only a few parables that really are not about the nature of God. Instead, this parable is about the nature of prayer. Jesus is giving us a parable about prayer. It's not about God being a grumpy neighbor. 
Instead, Jesus is teaching us to be persistent in prayer. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Keep going, even when it feels that our prayers are unheard or unanswered. If if we believe and trust that prayer is what brings the power of God into our world, if we trust and believe that that, that prayer, in fact, somehow is shaping and molding the future, then Jesus' invitation to persistence is key. Jesus' invitation to persistence is actually a primary role of the church. It's to bring that power into the world. So keep praying. Persistently, keep praying for your child or your sibling who has walked away from the faith. Keep praying for that relationship in your life that's hurting or struggling or keep praying for your marriage that's maybe hanging on by a thread. Keep praying for wholeness and shalom, that those things would come right here in Hospers, in Orange City, in Sioux County, in whatever part of the world you're in. Keep praying for wholeness to come. God works through our prayers. And persistent prayer changes everything. Changes the way things are. And as true as that is, I actually don't know if this is what I would say even the best thing about prayer. Here's what I would say the best thing about prayer is, especially the Lord's Prayer, is that it brings the power of God into our own lives. And it changes us. It changes us. Right? Why does Jesus call us and invite us to persistent prayer? But why does Jesus teach us to, pray, to, to make a prayer like the Lord's Prayer, a regular habit? Why does he do those things? It's not to convince God or coerce God to act on our, beh- on our behalf. That's not it. Rather, it's because of this. When we engage in prayer like this, when we make this a regular habit, it brings us closer to the heart of God. It brings us closer to the heart of God. Did you notice? Did you notice what what God promises to us when we pray like this? Jesus doesn't say anything about us getting what we want, right? This sort of prayer is not about getting what we want. Jesus doesn't say anything about that at all, right? God is not a genie. God is not a vending machine in which we just deposit our requests and receive what we want. On a side note, that might actually be pretty bad if we got everything that we wanted. But here's what God, here's what the promise is. It's from verses 11 and 13. 11 to 13. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, here's the promise. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the promise. This is the most beautiful part of prayer, the most valuable part, the most gracious part of prayer. It's not getting what we want. It's not about getting results. It's that we get God. We get God's presence the gift of the Holy Spirit given by God. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. That God dwells in us and God is present in every joy, in every, every disappointment, every pain, every celebration, every lament, and it means that we are transformed. That prayer transforms us. That by the Holy Spirit, we are being transformed. Eugene Peterson, maybe you know the name Eugene Peterson, he, he says it like this, and I think this is spot on. He says, prayers are not tools for doing or getting, but tools for being and becoming. Prayers are not tools for doing and getting, they are tools for being and becoming. Do you know the name Oswald Chambers? Does anybody know this name? This is a 20th century theologian, an early 20th century
century theologian, he says it like this. To say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying prayer changes me and then I change things. I love this. I love this so much. You, you've heard me say before that the only thing that we have control of, the only thing that we can influence in this world is ourselves. <laughs> the only thing that we can influence in our systems, in our communities, in our workplaces, wherever we are, the only things we can influence are, are who we are and, and how we show up. Or the, the biggest point of, of change, the biggest leverage point of change in our lives and in our systems, it's us. It's me. It's you. I can't control or influence you, and you can't really control and influence me. I believe really deeply, really deeply, the kingdom comes more and more. That shalom and wholeness come more and more as we experience shalom and wholeness. We are the instruments of shalom and wholeness that God has decided to put in the very place that we are today on purpose for a reason. And those things come more and more as they come in our own lives. I want to invite you into something. Uh, I want to invite you into something this week, but actually all throughout this series on the Lord's Prayer. I, I want to invite you to, to, number one, pray the Lord's Prayer regularly. Like once a day. Pr print it out. I should have had this printed out for you, but print it out. Stick it on a mirror somewhere, maybe in your car. Pray it regularly every day with me. But here's the other thing. Join me in praying persistently. Praying persistently. Trusting that what's actually being changed when we pray, it's, it's you and me. That actually what God is doing is changing our hearts. Drawing us closer to God. Maybe not changing our outside circumstances at all, but drawing us closer to God, maybe so then we can impact our outside circumstances. Here's the second invite. Uh, set aside a time to do that. I want to really invite you. I'm going to give this my best attempt, and I want to invite you to give this your best attempt. Set, a, set aside a time different than maybe what you're already doing. Set aside a time just to create a rhythm of persistent prayer. Ask God to change you. Ask God to change us. Ask God to change us, the church, the body of Christ, to draw us closer together to him. So I wonder if you'd do that with me. Maybe just make that something we can try out this summer, a regular rhythm of persistent prayer. Not for our sake, not for our benefit, but for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of our communities. So I want to end our time together by praying the Lord's Prayer together. The words are going to be on the screen behind me, but as we go into the, I want to, I want to ask you to do this. I want to say, uh, would you invite me in uh, praying the Lord's Prayer using these words that we are bold to say? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God, we give these words to you. We give our lives to you. We ask you to meet us in regular rhythms. We ask you to give us courage and grace to pray boldly every day. And through these words, through your Holy Spirit dwelling within us, would you change us? Would you mold us? Would you make our desires line up more with your desires? Would you give us courage to notice those things that we, that, that we maybe have to let go, those things maybe that we want that get in the way of your kingdom come and your will be done? God, would you meet us as we 
as we do all of this. We give you thanks for who you are. We give you thanks for your grace and your mercy and for loving us even more than we love ourselves. And for your son, Jesus Christ, we give you thanks. In his name we pray.